Well, hello again. Thanks for stopping by. This is uh, Franz Cantor, illustrator, cartoonist, uh, <laughs> doctor. <laughs> no. um, and uh, I'm going to do another caricature today. This is going to make me uh, feel a bit better, and I hope it's going to make you feel a bit better too. We're going through this uh, trying time at the moment, so suffering from uh, depression and loneliness and isolation, so all of those things, bad things. So who are we going to draw today? We're actually going to draw... I've just done a little sketch, a little thumbnail. Doesn't really make much sense at the moment, but it will after I show you this. No, we're not drawing Don Adams. We're drawing one of the writers of uh, Get Smart, one of my favorite shows, and uh, you know, really, really clever uh, spoof on the spy genre. You know, which started out with like James Bond, and then went into TV with The Man from Uncle. And then a spoof on both of those um, things, and a lot of you know different spy dramas going back to the fifties, um, uh, like Maltese Falcon, things like that. Get Smart um, was written by uh, Buck Henry, and our subject today, Mel Brooks. So here he is, right? So you can see a lot of money spent on those uh, teeth over there. Um, he is a, a really, really clever comedian, very clever writer and uh, director. And uh, I first uh, noticed him, of course, in Get Smart, his, uh, his very, very clever work. And then um, the, the next time I saw him was on the big screen. The next time I saw his work was Blazing Saddles, which was a spoof on the Western genres. And uh, that was incredibly... Uh, Powerful, incredibly um, funny film, and very insightful. And you know, the the best thing about Mel Brooks is that when he did um, parodies, these these sort of references to films, he loved those films, and it showed in the work. You know, so um, you know, uh, the producers is not actually a, a spoof. That's one of his original um, ideas. Very very funny. You know, this is the first film of uh, of it with Gene Wilder and um, and uh, Zero Mostel. Um, really cool. This is his uh, 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 writing partner, Carl Reiner. The Two Thousand Year Old Man is a very funny um, sketch. You should uh, YouTube that, or uh, you know, go on to Spotify and check it out. It's really funny stuff. Uh, this is uh, High Anxiety. Ignore the Japanese title. This is a send-up of Hitchcock films. This is my favorite Mel Brooks film. Okay, so all of the regulars are in there, um, ex uh, except for uh, Marty Feldman, of course, who, who wasn't alive then. Um, very, very funny film. A spoof. It looks like a spoof of uh, Vertigo. It's, it you know references the Birds, Frenzy, um, Psycho. <laughs> this is the shower scene. Some fantastic stuff in there. North by Northwest, um, it's just a really clever film. And, you know, full of these, these great um, uh, uh, actors, character actors, that just sort of uh, top it up. It's just really, really clever. Um, this is the, I think we're going to work from this photograph, uh, uh, actually, because it's, I, could, I love this movement in his face, the muscles. This is the poster for Blazing Saddles, of course, which is a reference to the, the, the uh, cowboy genre. And uh, this is him, a, a more recent version of him, another more recent version of him. Life Stinks is a, a, a great film. Again, another... It's not really a reference to anything. It's just a... It's like a social commentary on the greed of the 80s. Okay, so I haven't got any pictures of young Frankenstein. Of course, most people are um, like really remember him from that, uh, that film. So this photograph's a little bit blurry, so I'm going to have to investigate <clears throat> a little bit closer. As I said, this is um, a quick thumbnail sketch. Just give me an idea of what shapes simplified, what shapes can I push and pull here you know, to get uh, a, a really entertaining 
I'm entertaining me. So it's, it's um, how am I going to, you know, uh, investigate this to make uh, to make it interesting? Um, actually, you know what? I think what I might do is uh, take this head down a little bit because, although it's a fun shape to explore, I think it may be a little bit um, distracting. Um, so. I'm just going to take it down a little bit. And we're going to have some wayward hairs up the top. That's good. The part's over there. That's fine. There's a little bit of curly hair is coming here to give it more character. So, Mel Brooks. We all have our favorite films of Mel Brooks. Mine used to be various stages. It was, um, you know, Young Frankenstein, which is a homage to the Frankenstein, um, you know, um, Universal series. And um, very clever work, you know. And, I mean, he would get the effects uh, people from the original 1930s um, Hollywood um, films and the guy that did the, the sets and, you know, They'd work out the lighting, they'd work out the the camera angles and, and everything, just to give a very true impression. And in in, a, in, an, in every sense of the word, it's like a what we're doing here, right? We're, we're paying homage to these shapes and these lines and these details that we're finding in the face. So he would do the same thing with a film. And... Um, you know, would have a really, really cool, um, really cool effect. So even if you you weren't that familiar with the the original material that he was um, that he was caricaturing on film, um, there's enough of the public sort of uh, what would you call it the public domain. Um, Thoughts and feelings about it, so it's it's you're dealing with sort of tropes, in a way that uh, you know had a public imp there was a public impression about the work. So I'm just changing some of these shapes because you know when you back yourself into a corner with a with a shape, um, there's there's no way out. There's no erase button. You can't push and pull like in in uh, Photoshop, folks. You know you're kind of stuck here might be helpful. I wore glasses to see all these pencil lines in, in greater detail. Hey, are you, the photograph is still blurry. Oh, well. Um, so the face that we're trying to get is um, quite, he's quite, um, he's quite round. We're, we're actually doing like a kidney bean shape or that kind of looks like the lungs, isn't it? Um, so again, we've got an impression of light. So where's the light coming from? Probably at the top left. So we know that it's going to form shadows over on the bottom right-hand side of the forms. Okay, um, and we'll break up that shadow with some reflected lights that pick out some, you know, details and make it sort of more three-dimensional. So if you try to think of uh, a simple object like a sphere or a ball. Right? To make it more three-dimensional, you would be adding shadows, but also like a rim light, which lightens the shadows so that you get a more spherical, more um, three-dimensional point of view. Again, worth noting is the fact that you're um, concentrating your efforts in a T-zone area for caricatures, which means that you are... Um, thinking about the nose, the eyes, and the mouth. And not so much in terms of their correct proportions, right, but their relevance. So in a caricature, you, you, you're exaggerating proportions, but you need to concentrate on this T area. Because if you can recognize just this, okay, then that will help you and it will keep you kind of anchored. So we're looking at several anchors. One of, one of them is the, 
imposition of negative space, which is space around the object. If the object was floating on a page, there's no negative space. The idea of creating a balance with composition and using negative space is to roughly have the same amount of area, which is negative space, as positive space, which is the object. Okay? A good way of thinking about this is the yin and yang symbol. Okay, because what is um, what is what is black is white in equal proportions, and that gives us a sense of balance. It gives us a sense of order. Okay, so that's what we're trying to get with this framing device, and with overlapping uh, forms, you can have a sense of 3D, which pops out. I'm all about 3D, so it kind of pops out of the of the background, okay? I kind of have him... I like this sort of vaudevillian sort of lean into the picture as well. Um, that, that's a very interesting sort of angle. Okay, so all of those things we're going to work with and uh, we'll think about that as we go on. So within the simple shapes that I've drawn, I'm now sort of narrowing, narrowing in on a lot of these uh, uh, details, okay? So, again, think about the T-zone, think about the mask area of the face. Okay, so uh, i use this. For some reason, the black rubber seems to work a lot better, less smudgy on toned paper. So I'm using toned paper because I, I want to approach this in a sculptural way and use a white pencil for highlights. And, of course, for very dark areas, I'll use a black pencil. So this three-crayon method, or three-pencil method, was kind of pioneered by the high Renaissance artists. Um, that's as far as we can trace it back to. Probably, you can go even back further to, you know, cave paintings where they use three different kinds of... of they use charcoal and white chalk and, and um, clay to draw on the, on the walls of caves, you know, and they gave it... Um, a difference of, of form and texture, obviously, with the, with the rock, but uh, form and um, colour. Okay, so it goes back to then. It was used uh, a lot by the neoclassicists during the time of Napoleon. All right, so Jean-Dominique Angre and... Um, people like that used to do some beautiful uh, drawings. If you want to check it out yourself, just Google, um, you know, um, three crayon method of drawing or drawing on tone paper um, from the, that period and uh, you'll come up with some really interesting um, studies. It's a, it's a cool way of doing a study for a painting and we kind of think that um, Da Vinci's um, Mona Lisa was... Um, and most of uh, Da Vinci's work was um, created from drawings that were tonal and had colour accents because the brown pencil or the brown crayon or brown chalk, whatever you want to call it, um, is warm, right, which kind of approximates skin tones. So in terms of, of their um, artistic uh, um, the, the technical, I guess, terms for these things. Be careful with, with too many lines without reference to how heavy they should be. So maybe before I start to knuckle down on those um, that intensity, I'll just travel along the face, right? So I look out for um, lining elements up so that they're... Oh, there's a tilt. Um, so that they're they're correct in terms of their not just proportion. I'm changing the proportion, but uh, their relationship to one another. Okay. Now work lightly because then you can erase pencil lines that you use as guidelines, which is pretty cool. Um, again, be aware of big and small, like in relation to elements like the nose. Um, Mel's got a fantastic nose. Noses are 
Brilliant. I'm going to do um, Robin Williams probably tomorrow. So look out for that. That'll be fun. He's got a nice um, strong nose as well. And uh, we like those elements because with caricature we can really explore them. But you know what? It's not just a simple matter of, of relying on the basic shape uh, like a, a, um, the, you know, a, a basic shape of the nose, but try to get in character, get character, characterize those lines. So use a lot of, um, investigate the contours that you see in the reference, and then try to replicate those, maybe even exaggerate some of those lines, those peculiarities, subtle um, line directions, etc., for um, your caricature, because you're just adding more truth. This is what truth is in a drawing, right? Truth is something that, it yes, it looks like the person, but it feels like the person as well. So this is pretty good. I'm going to, um, actually, before I do that, I'll, I want to look at this eye and match the size <laughs> over on there. So I've got to be careful that I line up the horizontal and just make it look like it's the same looking in the same angle otherwise it'll, it can be pie-eyed or cross-eyed or something like that so we don't want that so work light enough so that you can s just see what you're doing but allow yourself room to erase back to paper you know, so that you can reframe the position. Um, yeah, it kind of, you know what the pencil lines are. It can be hard to um, work with sometimes, so you may need to run, uh, erase it back. So, you know, look at individual details and Overall, so keep going back for the big picture, the small picture, the big picture, the small picture, over and over again. And also lines, you know, directions, angles of lines, compare things, how they sit in terms of your uh, perception of um, uh, overall direction. So horizontals and, you know, verticals are, are, are good indicators if something is tilted so we want to try to get a slight tilt in the in the eyes but that will help with the um, the correct uh, sort of positioning um, sometimes you have to make uh, allowances for the because you're you have made a essentially made a statement as to the the shape the overall shape so you've simplified it you've you've um, simplified the overall shape but you want to uh, have you want to have allow yourself room to explore uh, characteristic elements Let's try to lighten this zone here a little bit more. I think would be helpful. That'll do. That's fine. I mean, overall, it's not such a big thing. It just it just works. Don't worry about the smudge marks outside. Just continue with the organic approach to the shading and the details. Um, I'm outlining these highlights here that I want to get, but uh, obviously I don't want them to be outlined in the final. This is a heavy lidded, lidded zone here, which I'm going to try to capture. Now I'm going to get some of these hairs. The hairs, think about when you're drawing elements, right? What are they? Do they have a sort of a tactile feel? What is the direction of, of hairs? Look at where they fall. Don't just draw hairs like squiggles. But try to think of the direction of hairs, right? Eyebrows are a very uh, interesting um, accent for the eyes because a lot of times they complement the um, 
They complement the shape of the eyes. And then sometimes they go in opposition to the eyes. So I know that sounds confusing, but we'll do a, a just an eye sketch. I'll do a, an eye sketch one day and we'll talk more in depth. So uh, this is the shape of the head and we want to try to build up a hairline around that and even though the the photograph is a bit blurry I can tell that there's a little bit of characterization messiness around the the hair on the sides which is adds more interest to it so it's not just a clean sharp line here it has you know broken elements okay so let's try to continue with this just clean up this um, framing element a little bit uh, I want to sort of line it up so that it doesn't go anywhere we don't want it to go kind of nice if it went according to plan but this is live um, guess what <laughs> it could it may very well not work I may not get the likeness but at least I'm having a go that's all that you can really say about this I'm having a go that's it so more about Mel Brooks. As I said, um, you know, one of my first favorite films of his was Blazing Saddles. I really enjoyed that because I was a big Western fan. I watched every uh, cowboy film and and uh, cowboy show growing up, Western show growing up. Loved it. Loved the genre. Understood it perfectly. Um, every joke from the uh, every trope that he explored in Blazing Saddles, I got. And I saw it in the theatres, so everyone in the audience also got it, which was, yes, vindication. We all have the same bad uh, taste in TV. <laughs> this, this, it, like, it, yeah, that makes me feel good, you know. It's good fun when that happens, isn't it? Uh, and then you think, you know, am I the only one with such crap taste? No! We're all we're all guilty. Everybody has the same crap taste. So um, it was great fun. Of course, uh, talking about crap taste, um, we we can't really go past have, having some television references, you know, pop culture references to um, to Get Smart. As as I said, he he wrote Get Smart with uh, Buck Henry, but you know, um, the, the energy that he put into, that uh, Mel put into his other films, kind of tell you that, that you know, it, it, he had a ball. He had an absolute ball on uh, Get Smart. And why wouldn't you? You know, you had the great Don Adams. Don Adams, of course, is the voice of not only Maxwell Smart, age 86, but also the voice of Tennessee Tuxedo, which was a great little cartoon about a penguin trying to get out of the zoo. Gee, I wonder what's that similar to? Hmm. Uh, could be penguins of Madagascar. Why, yes. So it was all done before. Yes, it was. Voiced by Maxwell Smart, Don Adams. Uh, it was a great uh, cartoon. Um... Tennessee and Chumley, and uh, Chumley was a walrus, his best mate, and they were trying to get out of the uh, out of the zoo. So it was kind of like a science show as well. Like you know, they'd have um, this uh, professor character talking about um, some of the methods, you know, like um, how how to make an air balloon or how. All of these crazy things, like for escape attempts uh, to get out of the zoo. And um, also uh, Inspector Gadget, which um, I never, I must admit, I never caught a lot of those shows, but it looked really fun. And, um, you know, in many ways it was kind of, uh, let's, you know what I'm, I'm trying to rem uh, think here is that the, this is what I'm, this is where I'm thinking. Okay, so if you think of the head as a ball, right? 
Um, and we put a longitude line on it, so now that's a globe, and then put a latitude line on it. So it's a sphere, it's still a sphere, but this longitude line, if it exists down the center of the features of, of, the, of the face, it kind of does that, right? Because that's the center line of all of these, these symmetrical features around the face. Now, symmetrical features extend down to the teeth, so the, these teeth have to reference this line, okay, as much as you can. If you don't do that, it won't work. It looks weird. So this is where I'm thinking about where to place, how far I can place these beautiful, expensive teeth. They look very expensive to me. I don't know if they're real or what. Um, they just look like there's money. There's a lot of money there. Um, now, I know he it looks like he's got an overbite. Bear with me, okay? We're not turning him into a hillbilly, not just yet. Um, it, it's a, a cool idea because I love gummy teeth. I love putting in gums and things because they immediately tell you that it lowers the intelligence of, of, of the of the subject. <laughs> um, it probably also lowers the intelligence of the artist doing it. Because uh, it's like... Eh. <laughs> it's like sticking in um, fake teeth for a gag, you know? <laughs> so... Um, Strong nose, strong, you know, um, elements of the face you look for to tell a story, right? So this is, this is what we're doing. We're exploring it together. We're looking at this, um, these features as, um, as a, a cartographer and as an adventurer would look at a map, you know? We're going down the Congo River here and we need to watch. Oop, there comes some crocodiles. These sharp teeth here, watch out. Um, so what this expression tells me is that he's a wisecracker. So, you know, he's got this sort of talking out the side of his mouth type of um, con concept. So look at the elements, the teeth and that. Don't just draw teeth for teeth's sake, but see if you can put something personal in there that you invest in this as a, as a story, you know? Everything, the lines, the muscles, the creases, the position of elements, the individual details, the texture of the skin. Um, these are all things that you, you play with. This is your vocabulary, okay, for drawing a face. Um, we know about visual vocabulary, which are like symbols, yes? Um, the brain wants to create a symbol of the face, which is this. That's what your brain wants to do. And um, you're constantly fighting with the concept of, of symbol over content, over the, the, um, the realistic uh, or the relevant um, um, appropriate details from your environment. We communicate in symbols. We could, we're very, very quick with, with communication. Visual communication is the quickest form of communication beats oral communication, verbal or, or um, written. Um, it just can't compete next to visuals. And of course, it's cross-cultural. So you know, um, a lot of the a lot of the things that we draw are able to be felt and understood perfectly uh, across different cultures. And one would hope, you know, the more we um, uh, try to communicate with possible life forms out in the galaxy, like uh, the uh, Voyager drawings uh, that were on a <clears throat> on a gold plate. Um, you know, back in the in the seventies when they launched Voyager, of course there was a um, a drawing of what man looks like, and a lot of pictures that were people thought, oh, well, this like. Symbols, is it? No, 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 guys. This is a, like a comic. 
This is a comic that they sent up into space to communicate with other life forms, telling them who the hell we are. And guess what, folks? We can draw. That's it. We're telling people, you know, aliens across the universe that we're drawers. We're a race of drawers, a planet of drawers. That's what we do. And we're very unique in that. We, co we uh, communicate in a visual medium. So drawing is a, is a superpower that everybody has. You know, we all have it from childhood. And not only that, but when we're kids, we don't just draw bowls of fruit or something. You know, we have, there's, there's a storytelling method in our madness, a storytelling method. We draw stories. We draw, you know, people, things, and they have stories. They have a narrative. So we're very, very, very aware of storytelling. And we're very good at it. So it's all of these things which are to do with drawing as part of our natural uh, evolution, right? Uh, more than evolution, actually. It's a peculiarity of just us because there's no other species. You, it's not like this. you can go up the branch and see these possums or something that our, our remote ancestors, you know, with, with pencils in their ears. That doesn't exist. No, this thing is um, peculiar to, you know, the... Um, Modern man, Cro-Magnon man. I haven't seen enough of the Neanderthals to see whether they're also drawers. Um, but the uh, it's enough to know that 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 we're we're weird. <laughs> we we are weird. Um, nobody else draws like us. You've seen. Films of monkeys drawing and dolphins drawing and elephants drawing and, you know, all of this stuff. But they're really trained to mimic us. They don't have any reference. So when they, they draw something, it's not, it doesn't have any meaning to them. But it does to us. Because for us, it gives us uh, a communication, uh, a power of communication power of storytelling as I said to you before we are storytellers that's what we do we're peculiar like that alright so I'm going to there's some uh, brown lines which I've thrown in there put a little bit of detail I'm going to go in here everywhere and put in a few extreme highlights that I want to try to work with so it's basically I'm trying to establish a hierarchy of light and dark. And uh, um, just making these little um, references to work back from. Okay? So I, I might knock them back. I might in increase them some more. I uh, haven't decided yet. But we're just uh, playing at this point. So investigating. So just take, you know, these these um, these drawings are like investigations. So they're really you should always take your time and sort of go slowly. And because not only are you you enjoying the the journey more, um, but you become aware of learning different things. And I'm learning a lot about uh, about this uh, face and the textures and things. So going back to Mel, um, Young Frankenstein was uh, the next film I saw. Um, and because I was such a big fan of horror films, that really um, excited me. And I remember I went to see it with my sister. And... You know, Sonia probably, I mean, she knows a little bit about horror films, but she's not like a fanatic like me. So um, I don't know how much she uh, appreciated the accuracy. I don't like that. How much she appreciated the accuracy of um, or the relevance of those uh, those films. 
uh, but I certainly did. So, um, yeah, I'm just trying to... I'm, I want to put in some kind of a rim light over here, even though it doesn't really... It's not really that visible in the photograph. I'm trying to create that feeling of three-dimensional form. And part of that is to, you know, have a a way of picking up light from other angles, as long as it doesn't destroy or flatten out the roundness, overall roundness that I'm trying to achieve here. Um, it's a, you know, it's a fun thing to it's a fun thing to play with. It's kind of like reflected light. You know how forms work with reflected light. Uh, that break up the shadows just a little bit. Just a little bit. These are like little accents. Okay, so let's continue on. Um, I think I might do some... Use a black pencil now and get into, into the shadow areas. So things you look for things that are blackest, black as night. Um, so things like eyelashes, usually quite dark on people. Um, but look at the reference and and decide you know what is what is uh, what is dark here. Um, another uh, good point is don't overemphasize things with lines, right? Don't outline shapes. Pupils and uh, pupils are right, but don't outline um, irises, for example, if you don't have to, because people with very light eyes, there they tend to, you know, blend more into the white of the eye, um, tonally, not structurally, but tonally, tonally. Remember, this is a tonal drawing, Okay, we're drawing tone, we're drawing light and shade that creates a sense of volume, a sense of three-dimensional um, properties. Right, so... Um, hmm. It looks like the uh, sh the more pencil that goes on the paper, the shinier the paper becomes, and the harder it is to work with the black pencil. But I'm going to nothing much I can do about it. I might come in with a black pen uh, afterwards and just sort of help kick out some of the some of the um, the details. Yeah, I think that might work. So. Um, young Frankenstein referenced um, universal films horror films which I got I, I really understood that and appreciated it the work that went into it you know not only was a funny film but it was it was lovingly lovingly referenced the, the genre to the point where um Young Frankenstein can happily sit on a shelf next to your horror DVDs. You know, you may put it in the comedy section on its own, but it can sit right next to um, Castle of Dracula or The Bride of Frankenstein or something like that. A lot of horror films are comedies anyway, so... They kind of cross over. Um, he uh, ho did homage to these films. A lot of films do homages to the genres, you know. Um, a lot of them do that. Very few people can pull that off, though, because, you know, just making a film that's referencing an, uh, 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 a trope doesn't mean that it's going to work. I think the test of it is that do you love it enough to research it and make sure that it's true? Is it truth that you're putting on screen? 
So his films worked. So yes, they were true. The next film that I saw after Young Frankenstein uh, was my favorite um, out of everything that he'd ever done, which was um, High Anxiety, which is a reference to Hitchcock films. And I never saw many Hitchcock films growing up. Yeah, maybe uh, North by... Actually, I'm, I'm lying. North by Northwest. I remember seeing that. Uh, Birds, you know, I never saw. Psycho, I never saw till years later. So I didn't know the references exactly. But you could tell from High Anxiety that they were lovingly referencing these films, these Hitchcock films. And uh, that made me go out and rent the films that, they, that he was referencing. So it made me fall in love with Hitchcock. That's weird, isn't it? But <laughs> I can't help it. That happens. It happens. So I love Hitchcock. I think Hitchcock is a genius, visual genius, you know? Um, and the reason why I've, I have a love of Hitchcock is because of um, high anxiety. Because high anxiety was a lovingly researched film. So Get Smart, yep, it was a lovingly researched series about the spy secret agent um, genre which was popular at the time, you know. But um, the staying power and the memorability of this show meant that there is truth there. There is truth in what he was writing in how, you know, Don Adams delivered it. There's truth there. If there wasn't truth, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't last, you know. So people wouldn't like it. And people loved it. So it's a search for truth. Um, that makes a difference. So in a way, when you're doing a, a caricature, right, you're exaggerating, lampooning, making fun of somebody's face. You know? And sometimes you can be quite cruel, right? But the true test of whether it's um, a faithful caricature is it if it has elements of truth. So what you put in there, you don't, you don't vilify somebody. You don't sort of, you know, make fun of them out of cruelty. You're actually exaggerating elements because you love them. You know, because you're in, you're invested in this project. So I love this man's face. Look at that punam. How can you not love that punam? Um, he's a you know he's a I love him. He's a genius and uh, very very inspiring work. His body of work is a testament to his uh, uh, focus and his love of the, the the content that he was doing. So not only was he, he's a funny guy and he's a successful guy, sure, but there is so much truth, so much truth in his work, in his films, and his, his uh, comedy, so much truth, you know. I think there might be a, there may even be a term there, like, um, you know, some famous comedian was said once, what's the secret of comedy? And he would have said, truth. But told in a funny way. Truth with timing. It's tragedy with timing. The timing's funny. Um, so, yeah, there he is. This is coming along. I quite like the expression. I think it's, it's working for me. F you know, I like the spiky, um, you know, the hairs that, that point down towards the nose. Really funny, uh, really fun um, lines that they they create. It's like uh, arrows. Beautiful, beautiful work. Well, beautiful work, but you know, beautiful effect that you're trying to get. So, 
again, keep the implements sharp here, you know. Nurse scalpel. Yes, doctor. Boom. Here we go. We're getting a bit closer. You know what? I missed out a, a, a line over there, which is kind of hidden by the nose, I know, because I've exaggerated the nose a little bit. But you know why it's important? Because it kind of leans, leads down to the, the crease around the other side of the mouth, which is not all obscured, just partially obscured. So, um, shading, lighting. Um, other films which I like is, uh, 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 you know, the producers, obviously, um, which was a very successful stage play. Um, Young Frankenstein also was a stage play, which I haven't seen. Um, what else? Life Stinks. Um, uh, Spaceballs. Oh, oh, oh my God. Uh, Spaceballs is... It's the bomb. That's, you know... That came out. I was prepared. I said, oh, no. You know, uh, don't do that to Star Wars. And uh, he didn't listen, and he did it. And it was great. And... Um, very, very funny, you know. But again, it's coming from a, a place of of uh, a, a good place, and um, you know, like the, they talk about the Schwartz in the. It's a lot of Yiddish humor and, and Jewish tropes and things in that which are not just appreciated by Jews, but by, um, by non-Jews. So it's a lot... I mean, go back to um, you know, Yiddish humor in, uh, say, Bugs Bunny show or something, or Mad Magazine. It's a rhythm. I, I call it Yiddish. I call it sort of like the Jewish... It's the Jewish art of self-defense. So it's... Uh, Wise cracking, yeah, making fun of of adversity, and um, you know being able to tame problems, tame tame life by making fun of it. So it's kind of a and it's all to do again. It's to do with the rhythm. Um, I remember growing up, my my father used to. He'd never speak Yiddish. He'd never speak anything other than English uh, in the house. But with his brothers, he'd just speak y Yiddish. And, you know, I was really impressed by the laughter, the humor. You know, that it was, it was almost like a language based on, on, um, on comedy, on, you know, fun. Nothing serious there. It's just all fun. You know, it's a, the one language that, you know, you hear about uh, how to pronounce Spanish words, you know, how to pronounce this word or that word. And, you know, some languages have a ch in the, in the pronunciation, right? That's common to a lot of languages. But Yiddish, I think, from memory, is the only one that has the, uh, the, the word in the, um, <laughs> in the vocabulary <laughs> does not exist in any other language. And, uh, you know, and yeah, my father used to use that in a sentence. So, good fun. This is I'm enjoying this. I hope you guys are enjoying it. He's a he, he's a great. Um, you know, I keep saying all these people. I love these people um, that I draw. I, I draw these people because, in a way, I'm trying to get I get them out of my system. Go away! Stop annoying me. No, it's like um, it's a homage. It's try, It's it's a chance to think about his work. It's his his personality. And what he's given me personally, you know, in, in, in my life, right? He's made me happy. And this is a time when people need to feel happy. 
So try to um, find a way, you know, back to our our happy spot. Uh, try to get some uh, pleasure out of get some pleasure out of life. Why not? Always think on the bright side of life. So I drew um, who else did I draw? I drew John Cleese. I love John Cleese, right? Um, my God, it's just he's just so clever. You know, I every once in a while I I. I watched the whole series. It's only a short series of uh, Faulty Towers. I really enjoy it. I really, really enjoy it. So we're going to go in, in for the kill now, figuratively speaking. We're going in for the kill. You know what that bugs me a bit? Those outlines in brown. Um, I'm just going to knock them back a little bit because it's a bit hard having all these working lines that crisscross the face. You know, and if I want to keep some of the grey paper, um, I need to uh, have it less pronounced. All of these sort of working out lines. So he's um, oh, he's got some great textures here, by the way. Beautiful textures. You know, uh, this is this is a thing about. Hu I love drawing animals. Don't get me wrong, but the thing about humans is that they're, they're so incredibly varied in terms of colors and textures and uh, shapes. You know, it's just, it's just magic to look at it, the variety. And um, a lot of these shapes are uh, helped along by the, the, the expressions. And the expressions are helped along by the thoughts that the person thinks about when they're making those expressions. And in many ways, these lines and wrinkles and furrows, etc., are created by, they're created over time. So they represent thoughts over time. They represent, you know, happy thoughts, sad thoughts. Just the human experience in total. The human experience in total. I've got some nice. Um, white over here which is a good uh, good time to put the white of the eyes in I think uh, we'll lighten the irises a little bit too because he's got very grey eyes or very blue eyes quite light in colour in uh, tone sorry not colour because this is we're not working in colour here we're working in tone um, careful with the uh, with the uh... very quickly I'll, I'll, I'll explain so the principle of doing an eye right there's the upper eyelid the upper eyelid has eyelashes on it and it has skin now, sometimes there is a uh, a separation between the upper brow and the eyelid the upper eyelid like this either way this is a fold of skin that overlaps hangs over the eyeball, right? In the center of the eyeball, a great proportion of the eyeball is iris, and then within that is a pupil, and the pupil, of course, changes size depending on light, also depending on um, the, the look of love, or, you know, conversely, the, uh, um, the look of terror. <laughs> um, so the, if you were to draw it from the side the iris would be a crater within the eyeball, okay? So it's indented in the eyeball itself. So you have to, when, you, when you draw the eye, irrespective of what you actually see in the reference, you have to think about the construction of the eye, this, this indented crater. So that's important. Reflections on shiny surfaces are important. 
and the textures underneath are important and the shape of un the structure of the of the shapes underneath are important right so what's reflecting on the eye from above the eyelashes it's also a shadow right because the eyelid overhangs the eyeball yeah so there's a shadow over here but that shadow of the eyelid is is affected a little bit by the the shape of the um, the shape of the forms that it falls on. Okay, so that I mean that's without adding the texture of the uh, iris itself. We'll talk more about that. We'll just do an eye one day and uh, and go into it in hyper detail. Um, so yeah, this is. Uh, this is uh, a drawing of Mel Brooks. So, um, very interesting man, very interesting man indeed. Um, he, you know, if I mean his the energy that he 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 exudes. In his face is evident in his in his body of work. It's just that wise cracking um, shtick, that wise cracking um, ability. You know, it just it's just so pervasive. It's so strong. The force is strong with this one. So um, this is what I love about people. I love this because these things that you, you feel when you're drawing them, right? It's a story. It's a story of their, their triumphs, their, their failures, their you know, happy thoughts and sad thoughts, the good times and the bad times and the ups and the downs, which is a common... It's common to all of us. Um, and when you see it like this, it's something that you share. It's something that resonates with you because you know that it's true. You know it's true. You can feel it true, right? So what you, your impression of people by their, their faces, the lines on their faces tell you so much about them. And oftentimes we take this for granted. We kind of look at people and just sort of accept them for what they are. But there's an undertone. There's a story, a narrative that, that you're only feeling but not really focusing on. And that's this uh, aspect that I'm talking about. So that's, that's why people continue to amaze me. They continue to fascinate me. Um, And we, as uh, you know, higher mammals, we we look at these these stories that we see, and uh, we empathise. That's how we communicate. We look at we're, we're multi multitasked uh, communicators, really, really superb um, visual communicators. We read faces, we read expressions, you know, um, and the things that we do subconsciously, uh, in many ways. Is um, is is you know worth volumes? So forms, um, simplification of forms to get into the the you know, a narrative that that you find exciting in the face this is all part of the um, the toolkit for an artist certainly for uh, character there's a there's a shadow on the the teeth too I don't want to from the top lip yeah so I don't want to lose that I mean he does have white teeth but you know So there's a wetness that we want to capture as well. Uh, we're getting close here. 
So there's shine on all of these uh, choppers and we want to be able to get now we're going for the contrast. I think we might need a bit more help. So let's do this and do some of that. Do a little bit of this for good measure. Why not? Put some shine in here, shine in there, shine over there. Shine there, bit of there. And we're going for this. That could have a nice highlight there over here of course be good to keep that in um, maybe a couple of these all right so far so good um, color in this Okay, so nearly there, nearly there. This is going well, uh, so far so good. It's kind of, uh, you know, with the distortions of the face, I've lost a little bit of recognition. Um, I might be able to bring that back with a uh, pen. Just before I do that, I'll just sort of... It's good to be king. So, um, yeah, Mel Brooks. I'm just going to go, this is the slow part probably. I'm trying to get a little bit more um, emphasis in line over here and the darker areas, helping out with a black uh, brush pen. Oh, the white uh, paint marker is a Posca, which is an opaque acrylic marker. That's where you have to sort of shake it to get it activated. It's like a little spray can. So the cutting in takes a bit of time, but uh, I think it's well worth the effort because it makes um, the features pop out a little bit, including all of these little stray elements of, of hairs and things. So, yeah, just uh, and uh, just squeeze this thing to get the, the ink to go through into the brush from the chamber and the handle. Um, this is like uh, cutting it out with a pair of scissors, you know, so you kind of, you don't go right up to the line, because if you were to go up to the line, you'd kind of lose the thick and thin effect of the line. So just give it a bit of space to breathe. These little wayward hairs, it's okay, we're going down to the big areas now, here we go. And then continue down. Try not to work over the um, smudging, the artwork is not a good look. Um, another thing too uh, to note is um, if you're working in a book, make sure you put separators like pages, blank pages in between because they can actually go through the, you know, the, um, the pressure of, of the pencil lines uh, can lift pigment from the other pages and give you sort of more smudging. Um, so, yeah, the uh, so other films which I kind of liked, my, my kids really enjoyed things like um, Life Stinks of uh, Mel Brooks and uh, Robin Hood Men in Tights. It was fun. Um, Space Balls, of course. But uh, for me, um, every couple of months, I'll watch um, High Anxiety. And I always get something new out of the experience, you know? It's just something else in there. 
that uh, is funny. Or um, just something that resonates as another from another film, a reference to another film, or or something. You know, and the other thing too, watching these these movies, he really got the cast right. If you think of Marty Feldman as Igor. Um, and um, um, geez, uh, Gene Wilder as um, Dr. Frankenstein. <laughs> he, just, he, he just got really the cast so perfect and allowed them to explore the character that they're, that they're depicting. And uh, it just it made such an, uh, a richer experience. So it's like Don Adams as Get Smart, so perfect for that role. You can't imagine anyone else doing it. But um, that was sort of like a character that Don Adams created for a stage act that worked really well. And you can YouTube this and early Don Adams and see, you know. Uh, it's not really referencing um, the spy drama. It's it's doing something with the with the trope that is personal and extraordinary, to stand out performance. Um, Yeah, Don Adams, love to draw Don Adams. So, such an incredible uh, body of work, um, Mel. So it's something that uh, we'll always treasure, we'll always have, you know, and I, I hope he's doing well, I hope he's getting through this uh, in one piece. So, um, without further ado, I think we'll do... No, there is a do. There's always a do. There's always, always further ado here. So don't think there's no further ado. There's a, there's a do. We should draw George Costanza. That'd be fun. So, here we go. Um, this is Mel Brooks. Mel Brooks and all his glorious beauty and I uh, love his work. love him. Great guy. And uh, this is Franz Cantor. And I will catch you on the flip side.